All right, obstacles to recovery. Are we ready? We'll see how long the little guy lasts. As soon as he gets squirmy, he's out of here. <laughs> The first one that I hear so much in recovery interviews, and oh my goodness, this was my issue as well when I first became sick with ME-CFS, is that if you have a history of being somewhat of a type A, overachiever, perfectionist type of person, that same person is still there when you're trying to recover, and that type A personality is driving your recovery bus. Us people who are wired like this or who used to be wired like this can, oh, score me, <laughs> um, can turn virtually anything that's healthy into something that's not. I became convinced that every single food in my kitchen had the ability to kill me, except for maybe kale when it was locally grown and in season and organic, of course. <laughs> Just anything can become stressful. And of all of the things I was doing, so many of them probably could have helped me, but in that chronically stressed out straight state and me trying to get everything perfect, I don't think I was ever gonna get anywhere. There's a really good expression, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This is a good motto to employ with your recovery. A second thing that can get in the way of our recovery is becoming a bit jaded and it is completely understandable how and why this happens. I believe I witnessed a lot of this with my mother, who also, as many of you know, had chronic fatigue syndrome for most of her adult life. And she tried so many things and nothing worked and she just got worse and worse. And then it just got to a point where even if anything new came up or there were new suggestions, it was almost like she didn't want to hear it. Like, I've tried it all nothing's going to work. Stop telling me that there is a way out of this because there isn't. And I just can't get my hopes up one more time, I think is the subtext of that. And many of the people that I have recovered told me that they actually encountered the thing or the combination of things that finally allowed them to fully recover years before they just were not in a space where they were ready to hear it. They just immediately shut it down like, nope, not going to work. Um, but then when they did open their mind and give it a try, they had incredible success and it ended up being what allowed them to get their health and their life back. A third thing that I hear a lot of from people who struggle with recovery and then also how um, once they got past this, it helped them to recover is they're not giving enough credit to the simple things in life. We have this debilitating condition. It has destroyed our life. It feels like it is, feels like it's robbed everything from us. We are so sick, we're suffering all of the time, and it seems like it's got to be something grand, something cutting edge that's going to heal us. Whether it's surgery, whether it's a new designer drug, whether it's you know $2,000 a month worth of some magic formula of supplements, um, whatever it might be, it's not going to be the simple stuff. And what I hear time and time again in these recovery interviews is how powerful the simple things are getting sunshine, getting it in the morning if you can to help get your circadian rhythm in sync and in a good cycle, which leads to good sleep, doing everything you can to get consistent, good quality sleep can go an incredibly long way, not in just giving your body time to heal and recover. Really amazing, restorative, regenerative things happen while we're sleeping. But it also impacts our mental health, our stress levels, and it has this ripple effect on everything that we do. When we don't have enough sleep, we're feeling overwhelmed. And it's just really hard to keep getting up and tackling our recovery in this state. You know, things like breath work and deep breathing, things like getting out in nature. I always quote one woman in one of my interviews who talked about how powerful the squirrels in her backyard were and just spending time with them, what that did for her soul, for her mental health. Like it's never ever going to be a bad thing to start looking at all of these things in your life and getting them in place first while you start to figure out what else is needed. A fourth thing that is sometimes happening that is getting in the way of recovery is not making recovery a priority, which might sound a little bit odd. You think, why on earth wouldn't somebody make their recovery a priority? But there are a lot of really understandable reasons that this happens. And it could be external. It could be things like 
demands you have in your life. Maybe you're still working. Maybe you have children. Maybe you have family members that you have to take care of. Maybe it's internal. Maybe you're telling yourself things that make you believe that you don't have the right right now to make yourself an absolute priority. You know, maybe your illness has a crappy name like chronic fatigue syndrome and no one, including you, on some level, thinks that it should be taken seriously. If you had a diagnosis of cancer or something that was more socially recognized and um, acknowledged as something severe and significant requiring all of your focus and attention, then you might feel that you have the right to make yourself an absolute priority and put up strict freaking boundaries. Be like, nope, we're fixing me right now. Like I am drowning. The operation right now is to save myself. And it takes a lot. You it takes a lot of changes. It's asking for help. It's changing your environment. It's hiring help if you need it. It's lowering, lowering your expectations on other things in your life and being like, they can just not be worried about right now. It's getting over your FOMO and realizing that you can sit out a lot of things in life and save that energy and save that focus for your health. Just whatever it is that you need to do to make sure that you are a priority. This was vital for me in my recovery. I was sick for about 10 years. And when I finally did recover, the biggest piece of that was coming up with a way to look at how much usable energy I had, see where it was going, see how much of that was actually things that were contributing to my getting well, getting rid of the things as much as possible that weren't, and then really zeroing in on the core things that were going to, I believed, deliver me the results that I wanted. And I, cheeky plug, did a Skillshare course on this, but you can do it for free. There's a link in the affiliate link in the video description. Uh, thank you for the support. If you do give it a try, I hope you find it helpful, but it's all about all of this. It's, um, you know, simple, short videos just to help you structure your life and find that focus and um, have tools and strategies to truly make yourself and your health a priority. A fifth thing that can stand in the way of recovery, and this is a big one, is not believing in recovery. And I'm not saying that just believing in recovery is enough. Um, it's way more than that. But you need to find a way to, as much as possible, hold on to that knowledge, that trust, that a future for you with a healthy, thriving body is completely possible. And I'm not saying you have to think this and feel this every minute of every day. It's completely understandable that sometimes we get down, we get depressed, we get discouraged, and we lose that faith. But to have things in place to make sure you pull yourself out of that place as quickly as you can and not get stuck there. Because there's something called the nocebo effect. It's very much like the placebo effect, but the opposite. It's where you believe something won't happen or something won't work, and so it doesn't. So in the same way people are given sham drugs, you know, sugar pills in these clinical trials and told that it's a drug that's going to help them with something. And then in a big percentage of cases, it actually does help with that thing. They do similar but opposite trials where they give people something. It might be the active ingredient, the active drug itself, but to being told that it's a placebo, that it's not gonna work. And because of that, it doesn't. So our minds are very powerful. And the thoughts, the information that we are feeding it have a dramatic impact on the future of our health. If you're enjoying this video, if you found anything in here to resonate or ring true for you, I'm gonna link up here on the screen another video that I did with Jason McTiernan where he goes through the characteristics of people who recover. It's really powerful stuff. It's not just personality traits to have, but it's ways of thinking, it's new habits to adopt, and it's just a really good um, pick, you, pick me up to get you in a good space to move forward with your recovery. Thank you for watching. If you found value in this video and in the videos on this channel in general, if you haven't already, I invite you to subscribe and consider joining. And if you do, I thank you for the support. I am sending massive hugs to you. I know it probably always doesn't feel like it, but I believe you can and will get past this. Hang in there. Do not give up. You've totally got this.